so I'm going to pray over the offering. Father, thank you so much for being such an awesome provider, Father, for being a sustainer, our refuge and strength and very present help in time of trouble. Lord, we thank you, Lord. God, I ask that you would bless this offering and all those that gave and had a heart to give. Father, I pray that you would continue to give us wisdom and finances. Lord, I pray, God, that you would multiply these, these gifts, Father, and they be used to edify and to build up your kingdom. Lord, we thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so I get the privileged honor of introducing our speaker today, who is not a stranger to United. He uh, is a prolific and prophetic and pastoral leader uh, at Gate City. Um, and there you go, yes, yeah. And, uh, and he's uh, just a great leader, uh, a great family man. His daughters are here with him today. They're also his intercession team. Uh, and they're going to be interceding for him before he comes up. So if you guys could just stand with me momentarily and we can just welcome him and his family up. Uh, all that are able, if we just give like a united welcome for uh, Hazen as comes up. Thank you so much, Carl. It's like 10 years we've known each other, 10 plus years now, right? You came to our leadership summit. I think that was where you and Arthur also connected for the first time. And so our journeys and stories are intertwined. And so it always feels like being here. I don't feel like a guest speaker. I feel like I'm coming home whenever I'm here with Carl and Alex and Wesley and Abigail and everybody who's just a part of the team here. So, all right, like I said, yeah, you can you can keep it playing just for a second. I'm going to have uh, my daughter, my eldest daughter, Amron, pray. And then Pearl, do you want to pray or do you want to just have Amron pray? You can decide, okay? But she's just going to lead us in prayer. I just wanted to ask them to pray for me today since it's Father's Day and felt appropriate. So. God, thank you that we can all be here today. And I pray for my dad as he comes and brings the word to United Church. I just pray that you would speak through him and that um, people would be impacted by his message today and that it would be anointed and that God would speak to this church through it. Amen. You know? Okay, good. You guys can grab a seat. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. Praise God. All right. I, I have plenty of napkins up here. I don't know where exactly here. You can hold on to those. Come up and dab my brow if I get fired up, okay? <laughs> All right, good. So I, I am grateful to be here, and I, I think they gave instructions on how you can get the notes. I always like to furnish notes for your personal study, but we may, may not follow all of them in detail. Today I have a few passages that I've prepared to speak on, but then I also felt like the Lord was visiting my heart with a prophetic word for this spiritual family today. So I'm going to lead with what I sense the Lord saying prophetically, and if we weave it into the study and preparation that I've done, that's great as well. So uh, today is Father's Day, and I have prepared a message on spiritual parenting. I will dial it in in some instances related specifically to the role of the father and calling forth fathers and spiritual parents. I also will speak to the ladies here because we need spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers in the body of Christ. We need those who have a revelation of what it means to multiply discipleship. And I'm going to share some of my personal story because the revelation of knowing who God is as a father specifically is the revelation that truly transformed my life in my salvation experience. And so the message of who God is as a father is particularly close to my heart. And I've gone through a spiritual journey, I believe, that gives me some measure of authority to call forth spiritual mothers and fathers and those who desire to disciple. And I believe for there to be a, a true impartation today, not just of revelation, but of real spiritual capacity to reproduce. Do you desire to reproduce disciples in the image of Christ, United Church? 
then I have a word for you today. And I believe truly if you will receive that word with an open heart and with faith, I believe God can bring something through this time that really will be a potentially life transforming if you lay hold of it. It may even begin a broader conversation. I feel like the best messages in my entire life are the ones, uh, whether I'm preaching or receiving, that begin a conversation that goes beyond the moment. And I believe in some ways you guys have been in a season where encounter-based discipleship has been the topic of the preaching Preaching from Arthur's new book, which I heard is phenomenal and good and being doing really well on Amazon. Praise God. It's awesome. And I asked, like, you know, what this is what's on my heart to share. Does that fit? And he said, yeah, we've been talking about discipleship that's rooted in encounter with God. And so now it's appropriate on Father's Day to come and talk about how do we reproduce that in people? How do we reproduce that in people? And as I said, I have some notes, but I, I really felt like, again, the Lord was just kind of dropping some passages in my spirit. But I, I really believe that that impartation, that activation of the word of God in our hearts, it comes as we pray and open ourselves up to the Lord. So I'm going to pray. We're going to preach. We're going to hear the word of God. And then we're going to pray some more. Amen. So just would you open your hands with me right now and let's pray again this morning. Holy Spirit, here we are. And we're not just here to hear a person speak. We can do that in self-help seminars. We can do that in educational classrooms. We're asking for the anointing of the Spirit of God that teaches us all things. And we thank you that that Spirit testifies within our spirits that we are the children of God. I thank you that it is a spirit of sonship, that it is a spirit of adoption, that it is a spirit that makes us acutely aware that we are made for heavenly homes and heavenly dwellings. I thank you, Lord, that the... 30 or so that are convened here today are more than enough to change the world as we step into what it means to be that which all of creation groans unto the revealing of. I thank you, Lord, that every heart is open to receive from God today. I thank you, Lord, that I get to hold the microphone, Lord, but, and so I pray speak through me. Uh, but I thank you, Lord, that each person in this room has a capacity to hear from you. And so we put a draw on heaven and we say, Spirit of the living God, Spirit of our Heavenly Father, we ask, speak to us. Brother Jesus, speak to us today. Our spiritual hearts and our ears are open. We desire to receive the Word of God in a way that changes us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, Lord, that you're raising something up in this house, in this city. Thank you, Lord. We pray the dream of God's heart over this assembly, Lord, that it would be a place where people are spiritually mothered and fathered and there's f spiritual family and an anointing for multiplication. And Lord, I pray today that there would be grace to, for people to endure pain in order to step into that place. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today's message is I'm going to distill down what I sense God has to say just in a real succinct way right now. The, the passages we're going to speak from, we find them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Psalm 127, you don't need to turn there right now, I'm just giving them to you for reference, and then 1 Kings 19. But what I want to talk about in particular is how we must firstly be children of God. We firstly must embrace our identity as children of God, which can be painful, depending on what your natural mother and father was like whether they were present or absent, and all of our parents ultimately are very inadequate in comparison to the perfection of our Heavenly Father, amen? Even if we have, quote, good parents, right? They always leave us with certain places of wounding and certain mistakes and certain things that we have to learn to forgive and, and, and move past in order to relate to the perfection of our Heavenly Father. And so we have to learn first to be sons and daughters, and this sometimes requires navigating pain. 
And as we become sons and daughters, then we mature to a place where we become natural and spiritual parents. And just because you may not be a natural parent in this room doesn't mean that you can't become a spiritual parent. I was a spiritual parent to people before I was ever a natural parent to them, uh, to my to my own children. I was just kind of pressed into because of the nature of the kind of leadership I had to express in our spiritual family at Gate City Church in northeast Atlanta, where I hail from. I was pressed into circumstances where even though I didn't fully feel like I was a son yet, I, people around me required spiritual attention. They required spiritual mothering and fathering. And so I was pressed into duty before I was really fully qualified, and that can be a painful experience as well. But God doesn't care whether you feel qualified or not. He, he qualifies the called. <laughs> and if you're called today, if you're here today, I want to tell you you're called to be a son and daughter. You're also called to be a mother and a father, whether it's natural or spiritual. And then, and then remember what I said? What did I say just a moment ago about what it means about being a son and daughter? There's going to have to be pain that you navigate in becoming a son or, or daughter, right? Look at somebody. This is an encouraging word. Say pain. I'm glad someone can laugh about that. <laughs> it's nervous laughter, right? Pain. As it relates to being a son or daughter. But what you hope for, what you think is when I graduate from being a son and daughter, which we never fully do, but when I mature and I get to be the mother and father myself, I'm going to have less pain and I'm going to preserve my children, spiritual and natural children, from pain, right? But what I'm here to tell you is bad news. But it's good news, hallelujah, because that suffering can produce glory when stewarded correctly. That suffering can produce glory when stewarded correctly is when you step into spiritual mothering and fathering, you're not stepping into pain. You're stepping into more pain. (laughs) Look at somebody say, more pain. (laughs) Are you ready for the altar call, people of God? Are Are you encouraged this morning? Pain and more pain, right? And any woman who's brought a child into this world, knows that parenting begins with a whole lot of pain. Now, there's joy on the other side of pain, but if that's how natural child rearing is, how much more so the act of spiritual child rearing? It requires sacrifice and pain to be a parent, even more than it does to be a son or a daughter. Now, I'm not here just to tell you that being a son or daughter, yes, it requires traversing pain and becoming a natural mother and father requires pain and spiritual mother and father requires pain. It's not just pain, it's pain unto something, and that would be my third point. You have pain to navigate to become a child, pain to navigate to become a parent, but the pain of the childhood, the pain of the parenthood, that pain is unto something significant, and that is glory. And in the kingdom of God, you truly cannot have glory without pain. The Bible will talk about it as brokenness. But I think sometimes we hear the word brokenness so much, we kind of spiritualize it and we go, oh, I'm I'm broken, you know, when when I get a little teardrop just just down the cheek, right? It's like, oh, I felt a little brokenness, felt a little sadness, felt a little inadequacy. No, what I'm talking about is, is the kind of brokenness that leads you with a limp for life that leaves you wounded in a way that you never quite recover from. And when we enter into that kind of pain and brokenness, what, what breaks you ultimately is what makes you. As you traverse that suffering that, that produces a recreation and a glory, and you have to look no further than the fathering of the heavenly father of his son Jesus, who ordained and planned his own son's crucifixion than to see that God is both a loving father and the one who is fully planning your crucifixion as he calls you to take up your cross daily and follow him as his disciple and as his child. And so God has crucifying events in your life, painful events, and this discipline is a demonstration that you are a legitimate child. And navigating this discipline empowers you to actually reproduce. It says in Isaiah 53 that Jesus would see the labor of his soul and be satisfied through the sons and daughters that would be multiplied. And you would not be able to be a son or a daughter yourself or a spiritual mother or father yourself except for the suffering of the Son of God through his obedience to the ordained plan of the Heavenly Father. And how many of us think 
well, yes, Jesus suffered, but surely God doesn't have that plan for me. <laughs> and I'm telling you, if Jesus had to suffer to enter into his glory, there's a measure of prescribed suffering that you're going to have to endure to enter into yours. And here's the comfort that I have for you in the midst of what I just described. Because I said, as you become a son or daughter, it involves pain. You become a parent, it involves pain. But that pain is ultimately unto glory. Is through it all, God does release a measure of comfort in the midst of the pain. And when you know the plan, you can partner with the plan. When you know the plan, you can yield to the plan. And can I tell you, oftentimes in my own life, I experienced double the pain because I was kicking and screaming against the plan. Doesn't mean there won't be a measure of pain, but some of the, some of the anxiety is self-inflicted because we aren't willing to just say, God, not my will be done, your will be done. And see, there's the pain in the garden of coming into agreement, but there's also a pain that comes from Peter, who was, un he went out and wept bitterly because he denied Jesus because he couldn't get on board with the plan. So Jesus had a, a righteous suffering in the garden and in the crucifixion. Peter had the pain of his own cowardice, fleshliness, and rebellion. And I'm telling you, you can be spared that pain. But you can't be spared the pain required for righteousness' sake. Somebody hear me today? So let's, let's begin talking about first the pain of what it means to be a son or daughter, okay? The pain required to become a son or a daughter. And I'm going to talk about my own experience with my, with my dad. It's not something I preach on very often or share very often. Uh, I'm sharing it with us because you guys feel like family. Because it is, a, it is a journey that is personal and painful for me. And I don't ever want to treat that um, in an emotionally manipulative way. I'm sharing my heart with you when I say these things, okay? So just being very candid, my dad never became a Christian, and he passed away uh, not as a believer. And that was one of the saddest and most challenging things for me. And you may be here today, your parents passed, and you know that you don't have a hope to see them in eternity. It, is a, it was a heart-wrenching uh, thing for me that that was, it, he died of a sudden heart attack in his late 60s, died out of time and out of season, and I believe the enemy destroyed his life, partly prematurely, and God had done some miracles of healing in his life. I'd been witnessing to him, but, he, but as far as I know, he never made a decision for Jesus before he passed. He died of heart complications related to his lifelong alcoholism, and he was likely an alcoholic before I was ever born. I'm his third child. I have two step-siblings that are younger, and I was the surprise baby of my mother and him who were not married at the time that she conceived me. They're in there. My mom was about at the age where she almost couldn't have kids anymore. She was, uh, I think, 39 or maybe even 40 around the time that she conceived and I was born. And even though my parents hadn't planned to bring me into the world, God had a plan for my life. And so I just paint this picture for you that, that I was born into a broken situation, and that situation never stopped being broken, okay, because of anything my parents did right. Now, there were plenty of good things that my parents offered me, financial provision. I was well taken care of my entire life financially. I was never physically abused or anything like that, but my, my parents were emotionally, especially my father was emotionally distant and disengaged. And so that gave me a picture of what God is like as a father because that is naturally what our parents are intended to imprint upon us. And so when we have good godly parents, even though they're imperfect, they imprint upon us a healthy view of what God is like. And if we have broken parents, and I just know I don't have to be prophetic to say that I I'm, I'm, would imagine that we're talking about probably, it's not 50-50, folks. Right now in this generation, if you have a good parent, you're in the 15%, right? If, if you have a mom and a dad that are still together, and there's not addiction in your home or your household, and your parents still, and, and your parents still love each other and, and are, are good moms and dads and husbands and wives to each other, you are in the minority in our society. I can honestly say I can count on one hand the staff members that I would look around at our church and say this person comes from a healthy Christian home. 
which means looking at you guys, the 30 or so of this room, I imagine, you know, 25 of you would say, I've experienced, you know, it's probably 50% some kind of abusive environment in your home, and then, and then the rest would be, you know, it's, it's a, it, it's a um, not terrible is as, go- as good as it gets for the majority of us, right, for the most part. And there's a very small minority that would say, my mom, my dad, they were good, godly parents. They parented me well, and they raised me well, you know. And if you have that, thank God. Go call your parents today. Say, thank you, mom. Thank you, dad, for the gift that you gave me. Because the devil is raging against homes where the knowledge of God is released through the parenting of the mom and the dad. Okay, so... When I talk about a little bit of my story, just a little taste of my story, and, you know, I could give you even just a few more nuggets and go, whoo, just like if I sat with you for a minute and asked about your childhood, I'm sure there'd be a thing i go, whoo, that's rough. <laughs> so just whatever your thing is, just take a moment. Go, what was the broken image of God that your father or your mother gave you? Maybe they weren't there at all. Maybe you never knew your dad or your mom. Maybe they... Struggled with addiction like my dad did. Maybe they were passive. Maybe they were actively abusive. Maybe they were neglectful in some way. Maybe they didn't provide for you. Maybe they didn't guide you. Whatever the situation was. I can remember my dad taking seasons after my mom and dad got divorced. There were six-month seasons. I didn't hear from my dad. My dad was entirely absent. And how many of you know that kind of neglect is painful? It's painful. And I'm sure as I'm talking about it, you're, I might even be pressing some of y'all to think about things. You're like, I don't want to think about that today. But I would challenge you that it's in the place of forgiveness and repentance that we're able to face the wrong view of who God is. And it's in facing the wrong view of who God is that was given to us by our mom or our dad that we can pass through that pain and step into truth and freedom. I know that it's true in this room. Some of us need to forgive a mom or a dad today. Can I tell you, I wrestled with God. As much as I chose to forgive, my heart was not able to forgive. But I'm so glad, y'all, that I forgave my father before he passed. Some of us are still holding on to pain, and the person that we want to say I'm sorry is dead. And you're not ever going to get to hear it. But you can choose to release yourself from the trauma and the pain and the failed expectations. And you can choose to live in freedom and live a different story than the one that was given to you. And the first step of stepping into that is navigating the pain and forgiving. Now, I'm not saying just forgive and forgetting to mention the pain. Because I know about the pain and I know that the biggest thing that you have to navigate to truly forgive is to confront that place of pain where your parents' actions, your father, your mother's actions told you you were worthless, that you weren't worth the time and attention that they were meant to give you. And maybe worse than a communication of worthless, maybe you were put down, degraded, dehumanized, dishonored, and abused. And you've got to confront that pain and forgive and you've got to accept the fact that the broken image of God that was given to you now you have to get your heart you have to do the work you have to do the work no one's going to do it for you of having your mind and heart renewed concerning the truth of who God is and how he sees you and that's not fair it isn't fair but life is not Y'all hear me this morning? But if you will take on that injustice and that unfairness and accept that though your mother and father may have, and navigate the pain, they may have treated you as worthless, but God calls you precious. They may have treated you like, like you were unwanted, but God wanted you. And if you will embrace the truth of who God is and how he sees you, despite the pain, you will be able to forgive and release your parents, and you will be able to get what you need that you were never given. You'll be able to get it from God. And that's my story. Though my situation was very, very broken 
and my father was absent and my image of who God was was distorted by my parents. And I had to learn to forgive them. I remember, this is the closest I can remember to, I'll just truncate the story. I say this is the closest I can remember to a salvation experience, a salvation moment. Y'all remember when you were saved? Some of us, is like a, it happened as like a bolt out of lightning, a you know, bolt of lightning out of heaven. You know, it's like, ah! <laughs> you're changed. Mine was more, a little more like progressive, you know. But something did change my life, and I can remember it was this particular night. as a, a, a ministry in our city that had a young adult Bible study, and I was there in the balcony at that church. About 2,000 people would gather on Tuesday nights for this Bible study. And I remember being there, and it was a season where I was going through pretty extreme brokenness as a result of some painful things that had happened in my life. And I'm at my college age, and I'm just being confronted with my own sin and all kinds of problems and issues in my relationships at that time. And... I remember the preacher standing on the stage, and he had a chest of drawers. No, he didn't have a chest of drawers. He had luggage. That's what he had. He had luggage, and he said, this, these, this luggage represents the baggage in your life that you're carrying where you haven't forgiven your parents. And he said, some of you out there are so fixated on the mistakes that your parents made and not being like them, but the very thing that you're focusing on, you're reproducing. And my parents, they're... Their relationship was broken largely because of unfaithfulness. I'll say it in a PG way because my kids are here. Largely because of unfaithfulness and immorality, right? And I had said, I'm not going to do that. And I'm, I'm going to be faithful to my spouse, faithful to, you know, and I, I wasn't married at the time. But I was dating someone that I thought I was going to marry. And I ended up being unfaithful in that relationship. And it just struck home when he said, you're reproducing the very things that you said that you would never do because you're fixated on not being like your mom or your dad. And what that judgment has produced in you is a double portion of their iniquity. Because you haven't forgiven them, you've judged them, and you've operated in the flesh and trying to be something different. And what he said struck me. He said, you need to, instead of not being like your earthly parents, you need to become like your heavenly father. And you need to ask for new spiritual DNA. And it just, just cut me with the word. Cut me with the testimony. And I just remember praying that night and the weeks to come, God. Be my father, I'll be your son. And from that place, I began to experience a real relationship with God where he was my father and I was his son. Now, that wasn't easy. It was actually difficult and painful to receive his guidance, attention, and love. Difficult to believe and receive that because of the wrong image of God and myself that I'd received from my relationship with my parents. But the fight through the pain to forgive and to look to God and say, this is what it's like. This is what it's like to be a son. This is what it's like to be a father. I can tell you, though it's painful, it's worth it. I remember the pain. This is my first daughter, Amber, who prayed for me earlier. Love you, sweetie. I can remember the pain of getting down on the floor, playing with her as a toddler. And, and it was a beautiful thing that I, I was like, man, God is... God has, like, hardwired things in me. He's given me wisdom to be a parent because I, I knew how to do things that I had never experienced myself. I never remember my dad playing with me one time as a kid. He was occupied with his work, and every morning he's a Bloody Mary for breakfast. He had a chair that he would sit in and smoke, and those are my earliest and most recurring memories of my father in our home. But I'm getting down playing with my children, and it was a beautiful thing and something I had to mourn. I had to mourn that I wasn't given that as a child. But I couldn't let the pain of what I didn't get disqualify me from offering something that now God was teaching me to offer my own children. I had to traverse the pain to become a child of God so that I can embrace that identity so that I can now give something to the next generation, to my children. And here's the story I, I, I want us to look at. So that's the pain of becoming a child, right? We have to embrace that identity, and we have to be willing to confront lies, deep lies impressed upon our hearts that 
from the brokenness that our parents have likely given us. And again, hallelujah. If you have mostly a good image of God because you have good parents, praise God, you lay hands on all of us at the end of this ministry time. <laughs> okay. My wife has amazing parents. Okay. And in order to reproduce what they reproduced in her life, they were the ones that had traver to traverse the pain of brokenness. But we get to be those that get to rewrite the legacy for the next generation. My daughter's testimony is going to be, I had a good daddy. He wasn't a perfect daddy. I'm not a perfect daddy, am I? No. But he was a good daddy, right? And she's going to be able to sing, good, good father. And she's not going to be like, I don't know about that, <laughs> right? It's who you are. It's who you. How many of y'all ever sang that song and you're like, in theory, <laughs> I don't know about it in practice. It's our testimony, but it's not sure, it's not. It's not fully what we've experienced, but when we break through the pain and we become the children of God, then we begin to become what we long to become for the next generation, and we get to give the gift we were never given. Hear me this morning, church. You get to be the gift that you were never given, and you know what? A part of that's painful. A part of that's unfair, but there's a part of it that's glorious. There's a part of it that changes and breaks generational curses that may have been in your, in your life longer than you have memory. Some of us, we're going to be the first ones in our generation that stay married. In the name of Jesus. Some of us are going to be the first ones in our generation that we don't have addiction, our kids don't have addiction. Some of us are going to be first ones in our generation that escape the generational curse of poverty and step into stewardship and wealth. There are all kinds of generational curses that have come where we've given ground to the enemy and primarily in our identity as mothers and fathers, we've abdicated our positions of authority. We've oftentimes given our inheritance to Jezebel and we worshiped at false idols, sexual immorality and addiction. And we've left a trail of brokenness. But can I tell you, you can be an Elijah generation that instead of giving a curse of brokenness to the next generation, you give a double portion inheritance. Turn with me to 1 Kings 19, and this was, again, not what I had planned to preach, but I believe this is the word for us this morning. And I, I want to leave plenty of time for ministry, so I won't belabor the point. I, I know that you're with me and that you're hearing what the Spirit is saying today. 1 Kings 19, this is after Elijah encounters the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. He calls down fire against uh, he calls down fire upon the sacrifice, and then the children of Israel all turn their hearts back to the Lord. They say, Yahweh is God. Baal is not God. And those false prophets, if you know the story, who had been like cutting themselves and trying to get Baal to answer from heaven with fire, they all end up getting slaughtered by the people of Israel. And that was the showdown was a high-stakes showdown, right? And Jezebel, who was the benefactor of those prophets, and was propagating the worship of her god Baal as a, a false worship in the land. She's real mad that her prophets just all got killed. And so Elijah, catch this. Elijah knows that there has been a moment of revolution. But what he's weary concerning is, he, is now he goes, you know what? It was almost easier before the whole circumstance changed because now it's from a revolution into a reformation and I have to take responsibility now for tearing down the idols in the land. I have to figure out how we're going to solve this problem and the, the authorities that were undisturbed by me before I demonstrated power, now they're all out to kill me. We're like, God, send fire, send revival. If you really get fire and revival in this church, you're going to have more problems than you did before. If you really get a spirit of power where people that are struggling with LGBTQ lifestyle come in and they start to get delivered and they start to break up in their marriages and in their relationships because they get right with God, whoo, you're going to have problems. Largely the church is unharassed because we're mostly powerless, unfortunately. 
I believe we have the potential to move into power. But if we're honest right now, mostly demonic forces are in place. Mostly when we pray for the sick, they don't hit, get healed. Mostly when they preach the gospel, veil lies before people's eyes. I believe prayer and fasting and the preaching of the word and spiritual sonship and raising up spiritual mothers and fathers is going to break that curse of barrenness off of our land, cause us to be a reproducing church again, a church filled with the spirit of revival. I'm not just talking to you right now. I'm prophesying to you right now. But it is not without pain. It is not without someone who is willing to endure the adversity of the seasons of drought and difficulty. It's not without people who are willing to stand in the place of pressure and call down fire, which is wonderful after the fact, but very stressful right in the middle of it. And so we see Elijah, he's done, wore out. And in 1 Kings 19, he runs away after having called down fire. After the moment of his great victory, he gets overtaken by a spirit of fear. And he ends up running to the north. And he's not where he's supposed to be. He's actually out of alignment with God's will. And God visits him in kindness as the word of the Lord comes to him. And, and Elijah's just been under the broom tree. Do you know what he prays under the broom tree? It's a powerful prayer of a man of God. Lord, kill me. Because he knows that he's grappling with, in his, and that's to encourage us. You know, in James it says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, right? I mean, he is the prophet of prophets. But after calling down fire, he's in the next moment in the pits of despair. Because our enemy is real. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. And you don't get heavenly breakthrough without demonic harassment. And Jezebel's breathing down his neck, and he's despairing for his life. And God visits him and says, Elijah, where are you? What are you doing here? And here he replies, from a place of pain. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with a sword, and I am the only one left. He goes, yes, we've, we've had a radical moment of breakthrough, but there's a lot of work to be done, and I'm the only one, and they're trying to kill me. And now they're trying to kill me too. Your demonstration of power, God, has not made my situation any easier. It's actually made it harder. And the Lord says, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And the Lord comes and whispers to him. This is that classic prophetic story you'll hear people preach from where the Lord is not in the earthquake. He wasn't in the fire. He, was in the gen he wasn't in the wind. He's in the gentle whisper. Take note, of what, take note of what the Lord says to Elijah. Go back the way you came. Some of us today know that you've been running from what God's called you to, and you just need to go back to what, the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus, and when you get there, anoint Haziel over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahala, to succeed you as prophet. And Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Haziel. And Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I will reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. So just to say it succinctly, Elijah goes, I'm alone, and they're out to kill me. And he goes, I'm going to give you a, a, a capacity to anoint your successors. And the work that you could not finish on your own, I'm going to give you three companions that are going to complete the work of judgment that you can't complete on your own. And he goes, Elijah, you're not alone, and I'm going to reproduce through you and an anointing, a prophetic anointing, and he actually raises up, Elijah raises up Elisha, and Elisha starts schools for the prophets. And see, what Elisha never had as a man who was alone, he navigated the pain, and where he didn't have a spiritual mother and father, he became a spiritual mother and father to Elisha, and then Elisha is able to produce a double portion anointing and communities of prophetic people. There was a reproduction that came because of the pain that Elijah was willing to endure. And God, who is a God of generations, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he did through Elijah and through Elisha what could not be done alone through the prophet. 
do you know, he gets those three instructions. Do you know how many of those three individuals, if you study this in Scripture, how many Elijah actually anointed? He's charged to anoint how many? How many did you hear? Three, right? Jehu, uh, Hazel, I should remember that one, right? It's like my name. Uh, Hazel, Jehu, and Elisha. And what he goes and does is he anoints his successor next, and he goes and he calls Elisha a few verses later. And now he has a companion. He has a spiritual son to do the work with him. But do you know that Elijah never actually anoints Hazel or Jehu? He never fulfills that assignment. Elisha does it on his behalf. The one who actually fulfills the commissioning of that encounter is Elisha, not Elijah. And I felt the Lord just speaking to me through this passage. Follow me now, church. That there are some of us that we endure the pain to become a spiritual mother, a spiritual father, and we reproduce. And the work that we may leave unfinished, God will tend to through those that we pr reproduce ourselves in. And the God who is a God of generations is working on our behalf to complete a generational blessing where there was previously a generational curse. Turn with me now, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Just pull it up in front of you, pull it up on your phone. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. This is the last few verses of the Old Testament. Malachi was the last prophet before 400 years of silence, prophetic silence, where we have no significant minor or major prophet. The people of Israel are going to go into a time of adversity and judgment under the Romans before the coming of Messiah. But the prophet Malachi declares, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction other verses say with a curse so there is a reconciling spirit that manifests itself in the earth the spirit of Elijah that same spirit that reconciled the people of God to the heavenly father at Mount Carmel that same spirit that reproduced itself in Elisha we see it comes in the manifestation of John the Baptist this exact passage is spoken of concerning John by the angel it says that he came in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just it's the forerunner spirit that prepares a people for the Lord it's the same as Isaiah 40, where it says there'll be a voice calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, bring every mountain low, every valley up, every crooked path be made straight. It's the anointing of spiritual fathering. And he goes, when there is an absence of true spiritual fathering and a multiplication of the anointing in the land, when I say anointing, I just mean the truth of God, the spirit of God, a place where the children of God can be blessed and receive their commissioning to go forward in the work of God. And when that generational transfer of anointing, of wisdom, of authority is intact. There's a blessing, but when it becomes broken, we see all manner of destruction. We see all manner of destruction. And what I want to challenge you with today, I imagine we probably have half the room has kids, half the room doesn't. Let's see if it's true. If you have some children in this room, if you're a mom or a dad, raise your hand. Okay, right. So about a third of y'all have kids. The rest of y'all are about to be commissioned as spiritual parents. And you might be a spiritual mom, spiritual dad before you become a natural one. But one day you're going to have some kids. Spiritual kids, natural kids. And the pain you've traversed in becoming a son or daughter. And then you embrace the pain like Elijah did in multiplying the anointing. Multiplying the power and presence of God into that next generation. As you do that, God withholds judgment and he releases blessing. How many of you want the blessing of God on the next generation? How many of us want to see the influence of Jezebel toppled in our city? Right? 
and revival and manifest power come. But it wasn't Elijah, though he had the confrontation at Carmel, it wasn't Elijah that toppled Jezebel. It was ones that were anointed by his spiritual son, Elisha. It was Jehu that actually cast down Jezebel, anointed by Elisha, the word of the Lord coming to Elijah. If you want to see generational strongholds broken, we need to have a vision for generational transfer of the anointing and commissioning. We need to begin to think just beyond our own spiritual authority and power. And can I tell you, it takes pain, like I said in the introduction, it takes pain to reproduce. So now for a moment, just longer, I want to just draw out that point, the pain to reproduce, right? Yes, it's painful when our parents reject us, right? It's painful when our, our parents uh, abandon or neglect us. But how about the pain when a spiritual child rejects you or neglects you? How about the pain of pouring your life out on behalf of a son or a daughter only to have you dishonor or betray you? And if you want to think about it this way, on the night that Jesus is betrayed, he as a spiritual father stands with his disciples who he been discipling, pouring his life into for three and a half years. And he looks at him and says, tonight you guys are all going to betray me. Pray that you don't fall into temptation. And they all fall asleep. When he's in his moment of trial, they all run away. And the main guy, his number one guy, the guy that was there for everything, you know, he's, he's got 12 disciples, but he only takes three with him up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he only takes three of them and draws them away to Gethsemane. These were his main guys, James, John, Peter. And one of his main guys, Peter, says, I do not know him. And when he's pressed on it, he cusses and says, I do not know him. This guy who only a few hours before was saying, Lord, I will even die with you. I'll never be separated from you. I'm a loyal, faithful, spiritual son. I'm going to go. I'm going to go with you to the cross. And he runs away in cowardice. Can you imagine the pain in Jesus' heart? Not just the pain of a son who's forsaken on the cross by his heavenly father, but the pain of a spiritual father rejected and abandoned by his spiritual sons. Oh, beloved, you want to be a spiritual mother or father? You want to reproduce? Then you're going to have to embrace pain. The pain of rejection, the pain of your spiritual children's disobedience, the pain of being misunderstood, the pain of dishonor. And if you will do that, if you will embrace that pain, there will be glory. And the glory is that Jesus gets to look Peter in the eye and say, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Three times he rejected him. Three times Jesus asked him to restore him. When he asked him, says, do you love me? He calls Peter into his commissioning, into his assignment to complete the work that Jesus had begun. Peter, if you love me, tend my sheep. And just as the work that Elijah began, he required Elisha to complete the work that Jesus began. It's a mystery, but weak, little pebble Peter became the rock upon which God built his church. And there was a generational transfer of commissioning, and he said, what I started, Peter, in the fullness of time, do you know that Peter's name is written on the foundation stone of the heavenly city? And those 12 disciples that ran away, Jesus said, I'm making you the bedrock of the heavenly city. When we look at the book of Revelation and John's looking at it, it says the apostles of the Lamb, their names are written on those foundation stones. Because of what Jesus was willing to do first as a son, a son who lost his natural father, by the way. We don't know how, but Joseph's not there, right? Right? And one whose origins with his mother is a disrepute to him. They say, we don't know where this guy's history is from. We don't, we don't know who his mom is. And jo Joseph wasn't his daddy, right? And so we see this picture of Jesus out of the pain of learning to become. He, what is it, the earliest story of Jesus? He's at the temple. He says, did you not know I would be in my father's house? He learned what it means to be a son so that he could navigate the pain, so that he could become a spiritual father, so that he could navigate pain, so there could be a generational transfer of glory and fulfillment and the accomplishment of God's purpose. And so I want to call you into that yourselves. And it's a twofold calling. It's a call into confronting the places of pain in your life so you can become a child. And as you become God's child, not just stopping there, 
Because all a child does is receive, right? But begin to take what you've received and begin to pour it back and reproduce it in the lives of others. And that second calling is a calling to pain. The pain to reproduce. But I can promise you, if you will go through the process that I'm describing, you'll confront the pain of what it takes to become a child and the pain of what it becomes to be a reproducing spiritual mother and a spiritual father. There will be glory on the other side of that pain. There will be transformation in people's lives. And we will accomplish things in this church and in Atlanta that can come in no other way. So will you stand up today? And will you say, God, whatever is required of me, whatever loneliness, whatever difficulty, whatever suffering, whatever I have to go through, whatever rejection, I am determined by the grace of God that my children would walk in a double portion. I am resolved by the grace of God that my natural children would walk in a double portion. And I'm willing to pay the price that my ceiling would become their floor. That the, do you know, literally, if you study the number of miracles in the Bible, Elisha, who asked for a double portion anointing, Elijah said it's a hard thing that you asked for, but he got it, and he literally does double the number of miracles that Elijah does. There is no Elisha without the pioneering of Elijah. But Elisha didn't have it easy. And so whatever your path is towards spiritual multiplication, God's desire is instead of multiplying curses from generation to generation, we would have the spirit and power of Elijah, that there would be a multiplying anointing. And you know what? There's a measure of purity and breakthrough and righteousness that I'm passing on to my daughter. And I, I believe that that blessing, you know, it says that curses go to what generation? The fourth generation, right? But it says to those who fear his name, God releases blessing to a thousand generations. I'm looking, for, I'm looking for where we've been weighed down four generations deep that God would give us breakthrough a thousand generations wide. These are the promises of God. But I could get up here, I could preach a message, and I could tell you all the good things, the inspiring things about what it means to be a spiritual mother and father. And I would be telling you part of the story that's true. But the thing that's going to take you out and prevent you from becoming that mother or that father that you're meant to be is the main thing that I've been preaching to you about, which is are you willing to pay the price of the pain? Because when that person that you've invested your life in walks away from you or walks away from the Lord, you're going to question, was it worth it? Now, for everyone that walks away, I believe God raises up two that are faithful. But you know what? I'll tell you the truth. You feel and remember the ones that failed more acutely than the ones that carried on. It just breaks your heart. It does. It breaks your heart. Breaks the heart of God. So you're in good company. God doesn't spare himself that pain. And so if we want to be his friends, we enter into it with him. Let's stand together and pray. I feel that you all have heard me this morning. I know I didn't preach almost any of the notes. They're pretty good. Go enjoy those on your own. Worship team can come. Yeah, I want to pray. I want to pray a commissioning prayer. And I want to pray a prayer commissioning you into, yes, glory, but the painful path to glory. The path of being betrayed, neglected, and taken advantage of. The path of parenting. Hallelujah. The path of giving, and if you're fortunate, you get some thanks along the way. I can remember there's a spiritual young man, spiritual son, that I invited into my home. And he was struggling addiction, struggling with gender issues, identity issues, and his sexuality. And I was young, I was in my 20s, and even have my daughter at the time. He moved out when my daughter was born. And... This young man, I, I did everything that I knew to do to disciple him and help him with the challenges that he had. Took him fully under my wing and at a certain point, the things that he suffered and had happened to him in the past were just too painful for him. 
and he went back to his old manner of life and he walked away from the Lord. He reached out to me recently, asked me to pray for him, asked to reconnect after almost 12 years of no communication. I'm praying for him, believing for God to have redemption in that relationship. I tell you that story because it's painful. It was deeply painful to have someone that you'd embrace as a brother, as a son, bring them into your home and they walk away from you, walk away from the Lord and sever all connection. There were moments where you go, is it worth it, Lord? This is painful. This is deeply painful. But the Lord spoke something to me during that time and it's something that sustained me to continue to hope because the promise isn't that that if you do right, then everybody else is going to do right. The world doesn't work that way. What God said to me, though, at the, at the end of that season, he said, thank you for taking care of my son. Thank you for taking care of my child. And you know what? I'm not doing what I do as a spiritual father primarily so that I will get the results that I want. I'm doing what I'm doing as a spiritual father, believing that there'll be good results, but I'm doing it because I want to be faithful to who God is in the earth. I want to be faithful to his nature, faithful to his character. I want to sow the seed generously and trust that God will see to it that it grows up into the fullness of what it's meant to be. So I'm here promising you, if you embrace the call to be a son, a daughter, a spiritual mother, a father, there is a guarantee, there is a guarantee that you are going to have Peters. There's going to a guarantee that you're going to have Judas's. There's a guarantee that you're going to have painful experiences in life. But are you willing to traverse the pain in order to have reproduction and generational blessing and the fulfillment of the call of God in your generation, even if you get no credit for it? So I just want to invite those who would want to say yes to this. You're not coming forward to respond to me. You're coming forward just as an act of faith to respond to the Lord and say, Lord, I want the spirit and power of Elijah in my generation. I want it on my life. I want a double portion anointing. I want an anointing that multiplies blessing in each generation and breaks curses. A reformer's anointing. I just want to say, if you want that, just come forward that impartation is here for you today. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. I pray, Lord, we'd have grace right now. I pray for each person as they come forward. Grace to pay the price. Grace to give freely with no expectation of receiving to give in secret, to give costly manner, Lord. Jesus. And you will do it, United Church. You will carry the spirit and power of Elijah. You will call down fire in altars. You will reproduce the anointing in an Elisha generation. This message is very dear to my heart. I have one son. He's four years old. His name is Elisha. Because the Lord called me. He will carry a double portion of the spirit I put upon you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that, that word that you spoke to me, that you would give me a double portion, son. I release that word to this city and to this house, Lord. Let it not just be for me, Lord. Let it be for this generation. Let there be a double portion of the anointing, Lord. For your glory, Lord. For your honor, Lord. Costly sacrifices. for you, Jesus. I prophesy fruitfulness over your lives. Fruitfulness in the parenting of your children. 
fruitfulness in the character of your children, spiritual and natural in Jesus' name. They would know how to pray and prophesy and heal the sick and cast out demons. They would know how to run businesses. They would know how to run ministries. That they would be anointed to preach. That they would be anointed to create. That they would have creative gifts and spades. Good stewardship of resources. No debt or poverty. No addiction in Jesus' name. Your word says when someone is caught stealing that they must replace sevenfold. So we play every place the enemy has been caught stealing in the lives of your church. We demand a sevenfold recompense in Jesus' name. Where through abuse and trauma, he's stolen the knowledge of God as a father. We pray seven times the revelation of God the Father. We break the curse of fatherlessness off of our lives. Where you've had an orphan spirit and it's been hard for you to find mentors because you just, you ask more of them than even what they're meant to give you because you're meant to receive something from God the Father. I just break the orphan spirit off you in Jesus' name. And I declare you are good ground in which the people can sow. You're good ground for mentorship and for discipleship that men and women of stature would see the gift of God and call it forth in your life. For ourselves, living sacrifices, Lord.
just imagine him taking every burden, every struggle, every problem and taking it on because God said that he can take your burdens. He can take your burdens. Meeting God at the altar is not just to stand in front of the pastor to look like you're there to worship. This is a moment to encounter Jesus, to encounter and let the Holy Spirit just keep you hot into the presence of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, God, you're worthy. You deserve the glory, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. We're going to sing this one more time. want us to pray out loud together just one last prayer it's just a declaration and it's an invitation to commit our lives to the path of pain for the sake of his glory and for the sake of reproducing I remember the Lord speaking to me he said you're going to offer better praise in eternity than you do now just want to tell you guys you'll offer better praise in eternity but what you won't have to offer him is your pain you'll have no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more tears. When you're in heaven and we worship in heaven, we're going to give him better praise than we ever gave on the earth. But you will not be able to give him your pain. You won't have any to give. So there's something precious about the brokenness of this vapor, vaporous life that you get to offer him something now that you'll never get to offer in eternity. And that's a life of brokenness. It's a life of enduring through the pain that righteousness costs. So, Lord, we commit ourselves by the grace of God to take up our cross every day. Just say, I'll take up my cross every day. And, Lord, by your grace, I commit to the path of pain and suffering that you might reproduce glorious things through my life. And just put a cry in your spirit. Say, put Hannah's cry in your spirit. Give me sons and daughters. God, give me sons and daughters, and let them be Samuels, God. Let them be prophets from the womb, Lord. Give us, break the spiritual barrenness off our generation, and raise up mighty women in God. Release a blessing through the pain of my life, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Put our hands together for Pastor Hazen one time. That was such an awesome word. Some of y'all going to cry in the car. I know I'm going to cry in the car, right? That was so powerful. But as we get ready to dismiss, just a couple of things we want to remind you. Um, no? Okay, cool. 
Uh, just um, Bible study this week. It's Wednesday at 7.30. Just be mindful of that. Um, we have also baptism next week. Um, we'll also, I believe we're going to be offering um, the second step of our discipleship class in order to uh, be able to, to jump into baptism. Um, we're also our first time guests. We want to invite you to uh, after party where some of our leaders will be in the back. We just want to connect with you. Um, and uh, for prayer, our, our ministry partners are going to be here, uh, and uh, they'll pray with you if you need some additional prayer. And it doesn't have to be concerning fathers and what was preached today. If you need prayer concerning anything that you have going on in your life, we would be glad to uh, pray with you, okay? All right, let's pray this, and then we'll dismiss. Lord, thank you for this word. We pray that you would seal it in our hearts, Father, and just confront us with it later on when we wake up from our naps, when we um, uh, just later on today, Father, as we're driving, we just pray that you would confront us with this word uh, and help us to live it out. Give us the grace to live this thing out. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We love you. Have a great Sunday. Thank you for being here with us. Mm -hmm.